angel said, do not be afraid. I bring you good news, one of great joy. And here we are, over 2,000 years later, still leaning into, hoping for, and sharing that good news. Amazing, isn't it? What God has done and, and what God continues to do. This amazing work in us, through us, and on behalf of us. Good news of great joy that God is for us. I hope you are experiencing the joy of Christmas, the joy of Christ the Lord come into your life this Christmas season. Today we will share some familiar Christmas music from worship leaders around North Georgia Methodism. Reason for this is an offering of thanks to those who have been our musicians and parking lot volunteers, thanks to our tech crew, thanks to our staff. 
Thanks to Pastor Shari and to Metropolitan United Methodist Church. Thanks to our church council that has remained diligent and engaged. Today, you have the day off <laughs> to worship with your families. Thank you so much. We are also offering this worship in part to help all of us feel a little more connected to other United Methodists in North Georgia. We are a congregation of United Methodists, one among many congregations, offering similar ministry, offering the same story of hope and peace and love and joy, offering it this season for the transformation of the world. May you be blessed this day with worship. Let us pray. Lord, we ask you to grant us peace, peace in our homes, peace in our church, and peace in our hearts, especially when it feels like the world around us spins out of control. Help us to stay focused on you this Christmas time and always. Thank you for loving the whole world enough to send this greatest gift, your son, so we might truly know how to work for peace in this world. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.
eternal light, shine into our hearts. Eternal goodness, deliver us from evil. Eternal power, be our support. Eternal wisdom, scatter the darkness of our ignorance. Eternal pity, have mercy upon us. That with all our heart and mind and soul and strength, we may seek your face and be brought by your infinite mercy into your holy presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I greet you in the name of our crucified and risen Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Jimmy Moore. I'm a retired elder in the North Georgia Conference, and it is my honor and my joy to be with you in this service today. I want to share with you for a few moments around the themes of darkness and light, and I want to ground that in the magnificent opening verses of the Gospel of John. And I invite you to listen now for the Word of God in this text. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses, Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. And may God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. May we pray. Well, God, I pray that it would indeed be your word that is heard in this hour, and that I not get into the way of that. Bless us as we worship together, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. I have a friend who often communicates with me around June the 21st, and he sends me a, a greeting of uh, condolences on that day. It's the longest day of the year, but he knows that I know that it's the start of the movement toward the shortest days of the year and the loss of light, and that's a grief-stricken day for me in one sense. And so he sends with, to me, with kind of tongue-in-cheek, a word of condolence on that day. He sends me a note of celebration on December 21st because the opposite is true then. It's the shortest day of the year, but I know that the light will begin to grow after that and I like that, so it's a day of celebration for me. I prefer the light. If I have a choice between light and darkness, I choose light. But the truth is, we live in a dark world, don't we? It's dark in, in many different ways. I'm preaching this on December the 12th, and we are moving toward the shortest day of the year and the darkest time of the year. But when John talks about darkness, he's not talking about the days of the year. John is using darkness as a metaphor to talk about anything that impedes the intent of God for our lives and for our world. And that darkness is around us in a variety of forms. We experience that darkness sometimes very personally. Perhaps we struggle with depression, or we're struggling with a habit that is harmful, or an addiction, and we struggle to, to get free of that, and it feels dark in that struggle. Sometimes the darkness comes to us in how we experience the community around us. Perhaps we see the social unrest that's in our communities, and that has a form of darkness to it, but sometimes it's more relationally than that. I remember a, a couple of weeks ago when I had a weekend where several things came on me that felt dark. 
we learned that one of our neighbors had been diagnosed that week with cancer and she was going to be looking at surgery and then in mid-December at chemo with all that that brought for her and her family and so we've been concerned about this good person who is part of our neighborhood. I have a colleague in North Carolina who let me know that weekend that she had somehow managed to tear one of the corneas in her eye and uh, she was in great pain. Uh, it looked like it was probably going to be treatable, but as a result of this tear, she was not only in pain, but concerned, of course, about her vision. And so I was concerned about my colleague. I was aware that weekend of a couple that I'm very close to who was, uh, began to struggle greatly with their marriage relationship, and it was unclear, and is unclear, if that marriage is going to survive. And all of these things were coming at me, and it had a feeling of darkness to it as that weekend came to a close. And then, of course, in 2020, COVID has been hovering over everything and has disrupted everything in our lives our home life, our schools, our work, our sporting events, church, everything has been disrupted because of COVID. My wife Julie and I have decided that we are not going to get together with our family as we typically do over Christmas, even though that breaks our hearts. We have grandchildren in Snellville and we may try to do a drive-by, but we just do not feel that it's safe for us to be with them in the way that we would normally be, and we're grieving that. This same weekend, these other things that I mentioned happened. I had a, a text from a good friend uh, on Monday that his daughter-in-law had been sick all weekend with fever and chills, and they were worried that she might have COVID. She had had a test, but they didn't know the results yet. And it was not only uh, worrisome for her, but her husband, my friend's son, is very medically fragile and so for him to get COVID would almost be a death sentence. And then he had been with my friend and my friend's wife that weekend so there was concern if he were infected might they be infected and this uh, communication I had used words like terrified and it felt dark to hear this. We've recently gone by the time when we've had 3,000 plus deaths in the United States in one day from COVID. And the experts are saying now that we're looking at 60 to 90 days of 3,000 plus deaths every day, so that by the time we get to February, a half million of our fellow citizens will have died because of COVID. One pastor writing about this says that in face of this enormous loss, my heart is broken and I am full of sorrow and of rage. I have a friend who is a spiritual director and she was offering an Advent workshop to anybody who was interested and she titled this workshop, Longing for Light. And I thought, what an appropriate title. We are faced with all of this darkness and we are longing for light. Now our God and our scripture and our faith are well acquainted with darkness and they never try to run from the reality of our human situation. One of the things I love about scripture is its honesty about the world and our lives and how we find ourselves in it. And it does not pretend that darkness is not there, but it does say to us, our faith does, that darkness is not the only word that is out there and that darkness by the grace of God is not the final word. And that is good news for us. We begin to get a glimpse of that even in the Advent season when we get this sense in Advent that God is on the move, God is active, God is coming to be with us and there are images of light woven throughout the Advent season. I have a book of Advent readings that I go to every year and the title of that book is Watch for the light. Watch for the light that might be coming. And then we get to the Christmas season, and this sermon is designed for the second Sunday of Christmas. Uh, John's gospel does not have shepherds and angels and the stable and all of that like we find in Matthew and Luke. But John has his own way of talking about the coming of Christ into the world, and it is powerful, and his story is filled with images of light and glory 
and of seeing. God, says John, through the Word is in the world creating. And what the Word is creating is life, and that life, says John, is light for all people. The good news is that God comes into the darkness of our world with God's light, and it is for everyone. And the darkness, says John, might try, but it cannot overcome God's light. Now John writes this passage in, in the first chapter, and it's a confessional. He's not talking about something abstract but he's talking about what he has experienced and what his community of faith has experienced. And John says, this is what we know. This life-giving word has come among us, taken on our flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen that. We have seen his glory. From him, we have received grace upon grace. And through him, we have been made children of God. And through him, God has been made known to us. And the way that we primarily know God, says John later on in his gospel, is as love. Jesus, the word, has made God as love known to us. Now, beloved, that's quite a light. A light that brings our identity as children of God, that makes God known to us, and that gives us grace upon grace. There is darkness in our world, and we have reason to lament and to grieve, and I sometimes think we've not done enough of that in recent months. But we do not grieve as people of faith, as those who have no hope. We have hope because of what God has done for us. We have good news. God has not forgotten us. God has not abandoned us. The light-giving Word of God has come to dwell among us. And we too have received grace upon grace. We too have been given an identity as the children of God. And we too have the opportunity to know God as love, active at work in our world and working to overcome the darkness that is around us. John invites us, I believe, to look carefully at what is going on in the world around us and see where we can see that love at work. And everywhere we see that love at work, we see the light of God breaking in and bringing hope and good news to hurting people. I think of a number of places where I see that light and that hope. I think of churches in this conference who are working hard to feed hungry people uh, in our communities all around North Georgia. There are churches in this conference who are collecting goods for new mothers who don't have the funds to buy uh, equipment to care for their babies and collecting items to give to homeless people in our communities. That's happening every week in North Georgia. There are pastors and laypersons in this conference who are working to find innovative ways online to connect the church members so that fellowship can be maintained and grow even in a pandemic. There are churches that are developing new ways of prayer and new ways of connecting people with God. There are churches that are bringing new life to persons who are struggling with addiction and depression and are transforming those lives. There are churches that are working to, to uh, address social issues in our communities. And we have a conference that is working to try to relieve the stress that pastors are under as they reach the breaking point in their ministries. All of these are evidences of God's love and God's light taking place in our conference. And John says, open your eyes and look and see this good news. It's dark often out there, but God's light shines. John says, you can miss it. You can ignore it if you want to, but it's still there. God's light shines and the darkness of the world does not and will not overcome it. 
look to see where God's love is at work in the world. And so the invitation for us in this year of 2021, I believe, is to trust in the light, to walk in the light as children of God, and to let God's love and God's light flow through us everywhere we go to all the people we meet. And I pray that for me and for you, that might be true in the coming year. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. of benediction from Henri Nouwen, who shows us the way to God. How do we know about God's love, God's generosity, God's kindness, God's forgiveness? Through our parents, our friends, our teachers, our pastors, our spouses, our children, they all reveal God to us. But as we come to know them, we realize that each of them can reveal only a little bit of God. God's love is greater than theirs. God's goodness is greater than theirs. God's beauty is greater than theirs. At first, we may be disappointed in these people who are in our lives. For a while, we thought they would be able to give us all the love, goodness, and beauty that we needed. But we gradually discover they were all signposts on the way to God. And then we know we too 
are to leave the manger filled with this message of God's love, God's generosity, God's kindness, God's forgiveness. We too become signposts for others to God and God's beauty and greatness. Be a signpost for the peace of God in this world where God's justice reigns and human hearts are tuned to God and to all God's people. Amen. Thank you.